Hello, everybody. Welcome and good evening. I hope that you all uh, have hopefully poured some delicious Nebbiolo to start this evening's event. I know that I have got three gorgeous wines, the wines that were recommended. So I hope that those of you joining in uh, have pre-poured your wines. Now, if you are just tasting along with another Nebbiolo, I can't speak for every single uh, variation or, or, or producer, but my recommendation would be that this is a great variety that needs a little bit of air to show at its finest. So my suggestion, a kind and, and polite suggestion would be, regardless of which Nebbiolo you're tasting this evening, if you haven't pre-poured your wines, I would do so now. And if you don't have uh, three wine glasses, uh, don't worry, pre-pour it into a mug. Honestly, you can pre-pour into a mug and then pour into a wine glass. You just need to get the oxygen in contact with your wine. So please, please, please do that if you haven't already, whilst I do the introduction. So welcome one and all. I'm Anna from the Tastings team and uh, I'm here this evening joined behind the scenes. Sorry, I'm just brightening up my, my camera. That was very low light there. Apologies. There we go. Uh, I'm joined this evening with lovely Mahesh behind the scenes who is here to help on all things, but more than ever to, to monitor the chat and check everyone's okay. He'll also be managing the Q&A. Please, 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 um, can you pop your questions into the Q&A? We are going to have time for questions, but we're in a tight squeeze tonight because Nebbiolo is in my probably my top three great varieties in the world. So I'm going to try and squeeze as much as I can in. And because of that, Mahesh and I are not going to be able to monitor absolutely everything in the chat. So we're going to need you to pop those questions in the Q&A. And that way, Mahesh can feed them through to me and I can answer them as we go. So whew, without further ado, uh, I'm going to pop up a little presentation. Ooh, um, hopefully you're about to see some lovely Nebbiolo grapes. Um, I won't show this for too long, you've all seen what red grapes look like, but Nebbiolo in particular makes, I think, rather beautiful grapes. Oops, sorry, dog in the background. Uh, we are eventually going on to talk about what it tastes like. So I'll quickly flash this up because if anybody is already starting to taste this evening, which of course you're welcome to, you might want to have a quick look at this slide. I will go through it, but if you're starting to taste already, maybe have a look at this slide and see if there's anything on here that you can already smell. So I'll just stop, <clears throat> pardon me, stop share there. Let's talk about Nebbiolo. Right, so first things first, it's a black grape variety. We've just seen that. And it's arguably, and I say arguably because I think most people would say it is the finest native grape variety in Italy. There's certainly some competition, no doubt about that. You've got San Giovese, uh, all sorts of beautiful things, uh, and you've got lots of lovely styles. But I think you'd be hard pressed to argue yourself out of this being the finest grape variety in Italy. It's famed for its quality, but it's also famed for its longevity. There are very few grapes that match the aging potential of the grape variety Nebbiolo. Uh, the two most famous places it comes from are Barolo and Barbaresco, which we're going to taste if you're tasting along. But if you haven't tasted those wines before, they are really considered the two top expressions of this variety. We've got a lot of exploring to do before we get there, though. So um, let's start with a quick history. 13th century was the first recorded mention of, uh, of the grape variety Nebbiolo, and that was within the region of Piemonte. Some of you may have joined me yesterday for my session on Northwest Italy. Uh, if you haven't, I'll include a recording to in the follow-up of tomorrow's email. But Piemonte, um, I'll, when I talk about the DNA in a moment, it, it really is the heartland region, and it's where it's most famous, but it's also where it was first recorded. And it was in 1266 where a count called Umberto de Palma, uh, he purchased a wine called Nibiol. Uh, now, because of that Nibiol and the way it was spelt, R N I rather than the N E, uh, there was some discussion about whether Nebbiolo actually comes, the word is derived from noble. So you will often hear a lot of, of Piemonte. Um, uh, natives call it a noble grape variety. Um, now, most people think actually that probably it comes from Nebbia, which means fog. And I have got a photo later of the beautiful fog 
uh, that covers the hills of Barolo. Um, and it's seen around October time. And the grape variety Nebbiolo is picked at around the time the fog comes in. So Nebbiolo is little fog. So more people tend to believe that that's the origin of the name. And there is a third uh, potential origin, which is that the grape variety actually gets a sort of white fuzz, really fine white fuzz uh, called a bloom around the skins that looks a little like fog. So there's an argument that that could also be the influence. But I think the natural fog that comes through the Barolo region that is so um, persistent and, you know, has been around for centuries and times almost when Nebbiolo ripens, that to me feels like the right reason that, that we have the name Nebbiolo that we have today. A few technicalities uh, about the grape. I think that's probably not the best word. I can't think of another one. Um, but the grape buds early and it ripens late. Now, what does that mean? Uh, the budding early is a problem. Budding early means that it is a disaster if late frosts hit and they are not uncommon. So one of the reasons that you will find Nebbiolo planted on slopes in Piemonte, but also around the world, is that if you have these late spring frosts, you are going to, to damage or potentially destroy the early budding varieties and Nebbiolo buds very early. Uh, the reason it's on the slopes is the cold air zooms down the slopes, which is really important. Uh, so we want that cold air to flash away and we don't want it to settle and create uh, one of the types of frost that can damage the grape variety. So we budded early and then we're going to ripen late. Ah, a problem. Um, ripening late is uh, a major issue because sometimes the, the rains are going to come in later in the season. So Nebbiolo in Piemonte, and I'm using that as a good reference point because most of the world's quality Nebbiolo is from that region in northwest Italy. But if you imagine you're leaving it on the vine until October, we all know that the weather turns in October, even if you've had the most glorious Indian summer, which Nebbiolo basically relies on because uh, it needs to keep ripening all the way through September. I'm talking northern hemisphere here, by the way. Obviously, it's the other way around. Uh, in other places. But if you want that grape variety to fully ripen, then you need to have these very long, warm uh, Indian summers. And you need to keep um, the rain away, really, in October. Problem. So we have a grape variety that is really quite challenging to grow. Um, it is also really fickle when it comes to soils. Uh, we'll go into soils a little bit more when we talk about Barolo and Barbaresco. But um, because it's so fickle with soils, the reason that Nebbiolo hasn't kind of become another Cabernet Sauvignon is because it really is particular. And Cabernet Sauvignon can grow in a few different types of soils, um, you know, terra rossa soils in Australia, right through to gravel and graves. Um, it has a really wide range where it can make premium wine Cabernet, whereas um, Nebbiolo doesn't. Nebbiolo is quite restricted in the soils that it likes. Um, Calcarus Mile, Calcarus Mile? Mile, sorry, pardon me. Calcarus Mile is, is arguably the top stuff. And that's, you doesn't have to grow on that, but if you really want the complex, finest style, that Calcarus Mile is really important um, or, or a portion of, of it in your soil. But of course, it can grow everywhere and it, uh, it is grown in other places around the world. It's just that arguably doesn't reach its full potential. So um, where else? Well, I'll go into where else it's grown in a minute. But I thought what's interesting is um, Barolo has not always been the heartland. So before Barolo found its fame, Nebbiolo was actually more commonly found in Novara and Bacilli Hills. Um, further north, where it's actually called Spanner, which makes me laugh because that was my nickname when I was a child. I was Anna Spanner. So um, I didn't realise I was Anna Nebbiolo grape variety, which I'm delighted by. <laughs> um, but in the 50s, there was a, um, the Industrial Revolution in Italy actually saw a decline of Spanner um, and a, a, an increase or certainly a revival, a renaissance, whatever you want to call it, of uh, Nebbiolo in Barolo and Barbaresco. So let's talk genetics whilst I'm on that point, because I was lucky enough last week to um, attend two seminars and sit next to Jose, um, what I can really badly pronounce his name, Jose Vallemoas. Uh, he's a Swiss gentleman. He wrote the Book of Grapes with Jancis Robinson. And yeah, I attended two DNA seminars with him last week about grape profiling and sat next to him at dinner. So I really um, picked his brains. He's one of the best um, ampelog ampelographers in the world. Um, 
And he actually discovered the sort of, or, or has been researching the heritage of Nebbiolo. So a few facts. Nebbiolo rose, even though it has the same name, is not the same grape variety. Uh, he proved that Piemonte and Lombardia um, are the most likely homes or heritage starting points, given the biodiversity of the species in those regions. So you find more clonal material, more like genetic uh, mutations. Um, and there are also many parent offsprings. So grapes being mum and mum and child um, with Nebbiolo as either the mum or the child in, in the region. So that is statistically and, and scientifically where this grape comes from. And what I loved, and this is just a fun fact, is that Nebbiolo and Viognier are likely cousins. So um, very rarely do you actually see too many commonalities. I mean, Pinot Noir, Pinot Blanc, Pinot Meunier, they're all related. Um, there aren't there always that many things in common, but what I do love, and I'm just putting words in his mouth, is Nebbiolo and Viognier are both very aromatic grape varieties. And I think maybe they share the genetics of that aroma. So since we've talked aromatics, let's, I've just seen somebody mention something I'm literally just about to say in the chat. Uh, so well done. Uh, but let's talk about what it tastes like and what it smells like. So um, there are some telltale signs. Uh, we, I, If you were on the call yesterday, you'll know that the MW seminar last week, we got three Nebbiolos in a row uh, and the dangerous thing was if you went to go and smell them when they'd just been poured, they often are pretty closed wines. But there are telltale signs. And I'm going to take my Nebbiolo de Alba to basically use as an example first up. Um, you're welcome to use any of the wines uh, or whichever wine you have open this evening to do this exercise. But there should be some telltale signs that it's Nebbiolo. First of all, the pale colour. I mentioned in yesterday's chat, it's a, a high tannin, pale skinned grape variety, which is really quite rare. So it's kind of good in a blind tasting, just if you're looking at the colour and the structure alone. They tend to have an orange hue rather than a purple or a ruby hue. Um, so we tend to be looking for like something slightly um, terracotta or brick coloured. Um, and then, as I mentioned, structure wise, high in acid, high in tannin. So your mouth should water at the same time as drying up, which is kind of a bit of an assault on the senses. What else is a classic uh, Nebbiolo trait? It is the thing that John has just mentioned in the chat. Uh, it doesn't happen to all wines um, made from Nebbiolo. But if you see these two things here that look rather unattractive, this sort of uh, Marmite looking thing, that's tar. And one of Nebbiolo's it's a very romantic way to describe it, but often very true. It's tar and roses is a way to describe it. And I think broadening it out from tar and roses, I think it's important to think not just about those two things. Violets, I often get violets. So there's something floral there, certainly aromatic, lifted. Um, but there's also something earthy, something not fresh necessarily. Um, and that can range from anything, bay leaves, leather, mushrooms, truffle when it gets older there's truffle and leather um the fruit profile can be and i've tasted all these wines earlier um my first wine which is uh my nebbiolo de alba which i will talk about more in a minute it was packed with red fruits it's really really red fruit forward currants um cherries possibly dry cherries i think that's even on the tasting note and then we go through to the Ritzy uh, Barbaresco that had more black fruit to me. So really just lost a lot of the red and started putting in black. And then when we get to the age 2010, it's a whole different ballgame altogether because we start to move into this area on the right. We're talking truffles, herbs, earth, um, all those beautiful, beautiful things. So that's kind of what the grape naturally does, i.e. from young through to old, taking on all sorts of things on the way. But it's also worth mentioning that it, and I'll talk a bit more about this in the Barolo Barbaresco um, portion, but it's a grape that is, um, it has a really lovely affinity to oak, but you also need to oak it because of those very, very tight, dense, intense tannins. They need to be softened up. Now, should, uh, I'll go into it more, but you definitely find uh, most producers will use a combination of new and old wood um, and often Slovenian and um, 
French would, depending on whether they're traditionalists or modernists. And because of that, you can really get a broad range. So you can get everything from vanilla right through to sort of smoky cigar box. So expect to find quite a lot in some of these wines, but really expect to find them once you've aired them out. They are not going to show at their best if they haven't been there, if, yeah, if they're not um, given enough oxygen. So let's taste it. Why not? Uh, all our wines this evening are from Piemonte, um, and I will go into the region shortly, but let's just really just chat about this wine um, and what we can taste um, and smell. So this wine, Nebbiolo de Alba from the Alba region. Again, I'll show you a map in a sec, um, but Alba being the main town around which the, basically the entire Piemonte is, is based. Uh, it's cooperative. It was started in the 50s, uh, late 50s, by only 23 growers from the Roero, dis Roero district. Sorry, that sounded more Spanish than Italian. <laughs> oh, they blur in my brain. Um, but it sits on the road between Alba and Turin. And this particular area really suffered during the um, post Second World War. Well, two World War. Uh, there was a big economic hit here. So, um, Initially, it was pretty poorly received setting up this cooperative. Uh, a lot of the older negotiant styles were not very happy with the growers all getting together, but actually um, it's, it's thrived. There are now 180 members. They make their own wine from 300 hectares. Um, really incredible. And uh, I've actually just tried it uh, with my dinner, which was duck. And oh, my goodness. What a pairing. I thought, oh, it's kind of it's going to be the young fruity one. No, no, no. This still packs a punch. Uh, so southeast and south and southwest facing slopes. So all of the slopes that we want to get our Nebbiolo lovely and warm. I've already mentioned it has a long growing season. If we put it on the colder slopes, it simply will not ripen. So we need to make sure we get that sun. South southwest is ideal for Nebbiolo in the northern hemisphere. Um, it's traditional fermentation, so slowly, long fermentation, lots of extraction on skins, but at a colder temperature, so it keeps some of that freshness. And then they age it in old oak casts, so we're not expecting um, we're not expecting too much oak influence here, um, and certainly the price doesn't reflect lots of new uh, oak, but we we should be expecting a little bit. So let's have a taste. Well, let's have a smell first. Part of the joy of Nebbiolo is the smell. So. I already gave the game away on a few. I'll tell you what, I'll pop this back. See what you can pick up. I find that a fun exercise. Um, for me, this is way more red fruit. And I do get some of that floral touch, perhaps not the tar and roses per se. For me, this is more um, red fruits and roses, which is lovely. Um, really refreshing on the nose. Um, and like I said, we know we're not expecting those truffles. This is a younger wine. It's 2019. We don't we don't we're not going to have the leather. We're not going to have the earth, uh, all of that stuff. So this is definitely in the lighter, refreshing vibe. Let's have a taste. Mm. For me, this is such a good, good value. Um, ridiculously good value wine, to be honest with you. Um, you've got enough structure. I've just mentioned about why it went with duck. One of the things that works really well is this incredibly high acid that's almost masked by the tannins on Nebbiolo. You do not realize how high the acidity is in this one until you're presenting a webinar and you have to talk. <laughs> um, the acidity is unbelievably high. The tannins balance it and they mask it. And good Nebbiolo should find that happy space where the tannins and the acidity play beautifully together. But the nice thing about this really high acidity is that things like duck that are very high in fat or cheeses or a very creamy mushroom or truffle risotto, the reason that they work is that high acidity can cut through it without you even realizing it's happening. Um, so for me, I just tried all three wines with my duck dinner. And they were all amazing, but this was this was probably the best one um, because it's the freshest and it was a pretty plain duck breast and it absolutely uh, worked, worked a treat. Um, please do let us know if you're having anything for dinner that you've specifically planned. When you've got a great variety webinar, it's quite fun to, to plan your dinner around it. And in hindsight, I should have sent you all some recommendations. But if anyone's having mushrooms, truffles, anything kind of gamey and dense, um, anything umami based, uh, all of those flavors are going to go beautifully. So let us know. Uh, right. 
we are whistling through, but there's a lot to get through for a great variety that has gone surprisingly um, well, has travelled surprisingly little. Um, so let's talk about where it has gone uh, before we talk about where it's most famous. So um, we'll start worldwide. Worldwide, uh, it has migrated. Uh, and I say I don't mean that naturally. Winemakers have taken it. It's not sort of up and flown. Winemakers have taken Nebbiolo to northern and southern Americas. Um, but it was a lot of Italian winemakers wine um, during migrations. And actually, the grape that shows more promise generally is Sangiovese, which is more common. So um, even Dolcetto, I would argue, I see more Dolcetto from Northern America than I do uh, Nebbiolo. It's simply too tricky to grow. Um, there are some plantings in California, there are some plantings in Oregon and some in Washington, but they all have relatively limited success. Um, and I know that Sarah Knowles, our USA buyer, is not really interested in them. Um, she buys Italy as well. And quite rightly, there's nothing that's beating the North, Northern Italian wines for her. There are some hectares in Argentina. Um, they tend to do quite high yielding Nebbiolo, so it's not got that richness and density and, and power. Um, and then Australia, King Valley in Australia, which is famous for, um, in Victoria in Australia, very famous for Prosecco Road, or I think it's called Gold Street Prosecco, um, basically has a lot of Italian influence and produces a lot of um, Italian varietal wines. Um, it's certainly not of the quality of Italy, but for me and my personal experience, King Valley has produced the better international Nebbiolos. And it's not that I've tried many because they don't exist, but I have had a couple where I've gone, OK, um, a lot of people wonder whether we just give up trying to make it an international variety. Uh, it's it's so at home in Italy and it has never really taken anywhere else in the world with huge success. It's not to say it never will, um, but it's definitely it's a it's a home baby. Uh, it likes its Italian home. So let's talk about where it's from in Italy. Um, let's have a look. Oh, somebody's having truffle crisps. Yes. Um, oh, yeah. And somebody else having duck breast. Ragu and Parpadel with truffle. All of the above. You guys know how to know how to serve your uh, Nebbiolo on a Tuesday evening. I'm very jealous. Um, I just thought I'd throw this in. Some, uh, it's a good example of how Nebbiolo can be trained quite differently. They have to do a lot to get it to fully ripen. Um, there's all sorts of canopy things they have to do with Nebbiolo. But let's just quickly talk about where um, where it's from. <clears throat> Pardon me. Um, Northwest Italy, and for anybody who was uh, at yesterday's webinar, I won't go into too much detail, but the places I'm about to talk about are the Aosta Valley, uh, Lombardy, and then really it's Piemont, this pink bit here, the, the main area. Um, it has a few different names around these three. These three are certainly the top top producing spots. Um, Picatua, I think is how you pronounce it. Um, and that is sort of on the board, oh, lost my cursor, on the border here. Uh, it's a DOC called Carema, which is on the border of the Valle d'Oster. Um, in Lombardia and in Valentina, uh, sorry, Valtellena, not Valentina, um, in Valtellena, um, it's known as Chiavanesca or Chiavanesca. Um, apologies for my pronunciation. I'm pretty sure it's Chiavanesca. Um, and there's really only 800 hectares here, but that is actually the most sizable zone outside the Piemonte, so in um, the Valtellina region of the Lombardy. Um, there were purported to be 81 hectares in Sardinia uh, here. They have, um, in fact, been found to be Dolcetto. So not even remotely similar, actually. Um, but I suppose if you're growing Dolcetto completely out of Piemonte, then perhaps you thought this grape came from Piemonte. We think it might be it might be uh, Nebbiolo, but no, it was proven to be Dolcetto. So really, the production is not only confined to Italy, it's actually confined to the northwest of Italy, which is why it's such an incredible grape variety to have such um, world that I, I can't I genuinely cannot think of a great variety with such a small quality zone that has um such worldwide renown um 
so let's talk about Piemonte. It seems fair. <laughs> it's very well protected. And I think that has stood the test of time. What I mean by that is I'll go into some rules and regs, but the quality level of Piemonte Nebbiolo has remained high. The, of the whole region, Nebbiolo still only accounts for 10% of plantings. Bearing in mind value-wise, it's a huge portion of the value of the wines of Piemonte, but it is not a huge portion of the volume. It's only around 10%. The rules, I'll take this down for a second whilst I talk about rules, um, but there are significant rules on where you can grow it. So that calcareous mile, mile that I spoke about is really important. Um, and they have these sort of southern um, facing mile slopes, and you actually are told that you can plant on those slopes. Um, the reason I'm being so sort of pernickety and saying you must grow on those slopes is um, when the DOCs and the DOCGs of the region were established, it was probably the most meticulous um, designated what can grow where. So unlike somewhere like Tuscany that many years later has had to introduce an IGP, um, so just a geographical protection, um, it's had to introduce that to kind of mop up the things that got wrong. Whereas there's a, most people believe that um, Piemonte got everything right first time, and it did that hugely based on soils. So quite an interesting part of Italy for sure. Um, now, ooh, am I going to be able to show you everything I want here? Ooh, bear with me a second. Sorry. Uh, so there's a few regions that produce it. I've already mentioned the town of Alba, and arguably Alba is where your top quality stuff is going to come from. Not exclusively, but it is worth saying that uh, a lot of it comes from there. So this sort of section here, I would like to highlight one little area where I love the wines of uh, Gemi. Um, and it's just here in this region up here in the Novara uh, hills. So there's it's this sort of subalpine region in the north. And here is where they also call it Spanner. And it's a very ancient, very small region. And we do often sell wines from Geme and they can be incredible value. They've basically just fallen out of, of um, not popularity by any stretch, but they've fallen out of fashion compared to Barolo and Barbaresco. Um, we've already had a Nebbiolo de Alba that comes from the broader region. So it's slightly tamer. Um, it's slightly lighter in style. I think we can use that word. Um, and it encompasses the wines of the Ruero region as well. Oh, I've lost my, my cursor. Um, never mind. But it encompasses the wines of Ruero as well. And because Ruero is less well known for its red grapes, they tend to call uh, Ruero red wines Nebbiolo de Alba. The other thing's really important to know, and I'm just showing you the Piemonte region here, so you can all go, ah, oh, get me there. Um, but it's really important to know that unlike lots of other regions, so Geme, for example, can produce wines from Nebbiolo under the Geme name, but those wines only need to be 85% Nebbiolo. That is really common in the European Union. Almost everywhere, 85% is the standard. You can throw in a few bits and pieces. In Barolo and Barbaresco, it is demanded that it is 100% Nebbiolo. That is rare, really, really rare to have a mono varietal. Um, so actually the quality level stays high. Yes, you hear rumors that people are blending other things in and I've heard Merlot gets blended in to soften it up a bit, but by and large, uh, it's, it's a mono varietal culture in Barolo and Barbaresco, so quite unusual. Let's go to Barbaresco. I'm going to spend the next 15 minutes just talking about Barolo and Barbaresco. I could have spent an hour talking about Barolo and Barbaresco, but uh, we, we must have had to, uh, uh, to cover. Oh, just before I move on, Collins asked, where, where did the Lange Nebbiolos come from? That's the really wide regional appellation. Lange is the name of the mountain ranges. So Lange Nebbiolo, and bear with me because I'm going to try and do it quickly. It's quite hard to tell you exactly. Um, but basically, it's almost exclusive. It's like all of this. I don't know if you can see that. My cursor's not moving. That big chunk, oh, it's not moving, sorry. That big chunk in the middle. Lange Nebbiolo goes right from sort of up by Turin, where you can see um, 
That's annoying, it's not moving, I apologize. Uh, stretching the whole region. Now that does mean Lange has a pretty wide quality spectrum, but it also means that some of the Lange vineyards are actually within that amazing, um, you know, Barolo area and Barbaresco area. So sometimes you get producers, Ritzy is one of them, Ritzy that we're about to talk about, they produce the Wine Society's exhibition, Lange Nebbiolo. It is delicious. Um, oh, you could see it. Okay, sorry. It's frozen on my screen. Um, right, so let's talk Barbaresco. Barbaresco has kind of lived, um, I should mention just quickly, um, we had a Barbera yesterday and I was talking to my father about it afterwards and he said, what's the difference between Barbera and Barbaresco? And it's a very fair point because they're both in the region of Piemonte, but Barbera is a grape variety. And the easiest way to remember that is if you are familiar with your grape variety names, Barbera de Alba is a Barbera from the Alba region. So it's a grape from the Alba region. You could not have a Barbaresco de Alba because Barbaresco is its own region. So if you remember things by sounds like I do, Barbaresco is, um, is the region. It's, it's, I was about to say something awful. I was about to say it's a baby Barolo, but it's not. I'm about to tell you that it's not a baby Barolo. <laughs> Historically, it has been, and that's just not the case anymore. Um, until really the 1960s, nobody had really heard of Barbaresco. Barolo was on the way up and Barbaresco was sat on its coattails, sort of being dragged behind it. Um, but they have most definitely, I'll stop sharing that because there's no information on it. Um, they have most definitely converged in style. Um, it was once the sort of softer, lighter style, and that's just simply not the case anymore. There are a few differences um, that I'll talk about, both in terms of legal requirements and the soils. Um, but certainly it's, um, don't think of it as a baby Barolo anymore. In fact, a lot of, a lot of, um, the MW is arguing why something is, is uh, a Barbaresco versus a Barolo, for example. And even the MWs who were, who were giving us feedback said, it's nearly impossible to tell now. You're going to have to take a guess. Um, so let's talk about the Barbaresco. Um, as we, well, sorry, let's taste the Barbaresco as we talk about Barbaresco. Um, it's in the northeast, uh, northeast of the city of Alba, and it's only a third of Barolo, so it's a much smaller region, actually. Um, and 95% of all of the Barbaresco comes from three little townships. Um, they are called Bar uh, Barbaresco, no, not called Barolo, <laughs> Barbaresco, uh, Trieso, and Nieve. And those are the three top ones. You can sometimes see those on the label, but it depends. Um, the clay that is found in the Barbaresco regions is similar to, and when we go into Barolo in a moment, I'll explain, but two of Barolo's communes, they're actually split literally by a road. Two of the communes have one style of soil and three have another. And La Mora and Barolo in Barolo have a more fruit forward style. And those soils, um, they are the exact soils of Barbaresco. So you actually find the most convergence, the most similarities. If you're drinking a Barolo from La Mora or Barolo, they're more similar to Barbaresco in style. Um, the main difference in terms of growing region, and I think this is nearly impossible to taste quite honestly, but if you want to get technical, they do ripen slightly, their grapes slightly earlier in Barbaresco because they're close to the river Tenaro, they're closer, so they have this moderating influence. Um, that will sometimes mean that the wines are lighter um, and the aging requirements are then therefore uh, slightly less. Um, so for a Barbaresco, it's 26 months in total they need to be aged, so just over two years, and nine of those legally need to be in oak. Um, so you have a, um, sorry, I'm just thinking out loud. Yes. Um, I think that's right. It might be six. No, 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 that is right. Um, but they have less, they have less demand for oak aging, which is important. And I, I've got um I've got somewhere the reserver stats if you're interested, but I might have to dig those out. They're on my desktop somewhere. Um, the reserver is slightly more, but that's a standard. Uh, it can be released nearly a year later. Uh, sorry, nearly a year earlier than its Barolo counterparts. So let's have a smell and let's talk about this exact wine. Um, I mentioned earlier it's slightly more fruit forward um, from the black fruits, in my opinion. So 
I've started to get some more cherry here. I'm actually also getting more of that new oak. Now, weirdly enough, this actually saw 12 months in a large oak barrel and then went into concrete and then was aged in bottle before aging. Um, so it has had oak, but they were large oak barrels again. But something about this is giving me a sort of sweeter spice. Um, yeah. Slightly more vanilla, maybe a bit of clove, those sorts of lovely elevated aromas. There is a gorgeous floral thing to this wine as well. Um, I always love that about Nebbiolo. It smells like it should be sort of light and perfumed and potpourri. And then when you taste it, it's got this incredible structure in, in the mouth. Um, Ritzy is a beautiful, um, beautiful producer. We did an event with them last year and uh, they're well worth a visit if you're in the area. They have 15 hectares. Um, of Nebbiolo planted and they're from about the 19th century the family have lived there but it wasn't until the grandfather of the current generation Enrico uh, started um, started really uh, looking after vines and planting vines. Um, the I've just seen a question pop up why would these ripen earlier because of the river um, rivers and bodies of water tend to have a moderating influence for a few reasons but one of them is literally as simple as light reflects off the water and hits the vines so the closer you are to that sunshine reflection it's really important to help photosynthesis and the ripening of the grapes and the other is that depending on the size of the body of water and this isn't a huge river um, but there will be some moderating influence um, that, that it will store some heat but rivers tend not to do that as well as lakes do lakes store the water and then they slowly release it rivers less so but you're definitely going to get some of the um reflected sunshine that will help with the photosynthesis and the ripening uh, these are grown at altitude, about 200 to 300 uh, meters. They are um, on that lovely clay calcareous I spoke about earlier. They're hand harvested. Um, yeah, I think this is a fabulous wine. And I have to say, probably the most approachable of the three this evening, in my opinion. It's very fine tuned. It's been made beautifully. And it's everything I think a Barbaresco should be. So I'm going to have a quick taste. Mm. Perfect for me. On the palate, really quite intense, um, very fine chalky tannins, that lovely high acidity. It's very, very fruit forward to me. Sorry, lots of acidity again. Really fruit forward. So plums, cherries, almost blueberries. And I didn't have blueberries on my um on my little slide, but packing loads of fruit. It's a young wine again. Um, I'll share the screen, but annoyingly, there's not much information on here because it's sold out. Um, I'm going to have a look at when we're getting this wine. We won't be getting this vintage back in, but I'll find out when the 29 or 2019, pardon me, will come in. Um, obviously, with aging regulations, probably not particularly quickly. Um, but just for reference, this wine was £23. So this is a slightly more expensive, as you would expect, um, with it being a crew uh, and one of the finest places, but I think £23, really good value. Um, it will age 2028, I think, yes, absolutely. You're going to start to get some of them, some of those more developed sort of mushroom, truffle, maybe dried fruit notes. I think Barbaresco in particular for me, because it can be quite fruity, the dried fruit is what is amazing in an older Barbaresco. Um, We'll park it. If you are lucky enough to have both side by side, please do a comparison. But do remember this is a 2019. So this is, is higher in tannins, it's quite intense, um, and it's certainly fruit driven rather than all of the other bits that we will go on to now. Here's the beautiful oak barrels of Ritzy I thought I'd show you. Um, oh, Mahesh has just told me that we do have one of their other uh, Barbarescos, which is the Nervo. Um, Single, I think Nervo is their single vineyard, Barbaresco, uh, from memory. Um, but that's not due to be released this year. But if you did like this style of wine, then maybe keep your eyes peeled because we'll have one of the single vineyard Barbarescos coming up probably next year. We'll have to bend Sarah Knowles' arms. Uh, but these are their beautiful, I mentioned they were in, in wood first and then concrete. Um, that preserves, that concrete preserves some of the freshness, which I think is really important for this wine style, as well as the oak aging, which you need to help massage the tannins. 
So last but not least, let's go on to our 2010 Barolo Busia. And Busia is the um, particular region um, within Barolo. And this is made for us by Silvano Bolmida. Silvano uh, made, well, I should say, I shouldn't say Silvano, uh, but this producer, sorry, um, they make our exhibition uh barolo so you had if you tasted along with me yesterday we had a 2017 um so this is what happens with this particular produce producers wine when they age i'll quickly tell you a little bit um about the region um, and then i'll tell you a little bit afterwards about the producer um but this is just to imagine this is where this lovely wine came from uh, so Barolo is about nine miles from Alba. I think I mentioned that yesterday, so apologies. Um, it started, to, the name Barolo started to appear on labels around the mid 19th century. And that actually coincided with wines being bottled as opposed to before when they were sort of sold in big vats. Um, it hasn't always been fine wine. They had huge problems with uh, volatile acidity, premature oxidation. So they had these um, big technical winemaking problems. And I've mentioned it in, in both my Northern Italy webinars thus far, the Industrial Revolution really revol revolutionized um, Northern Italian winemaking. And so it was absolutely essential, um, not only the actual Industrial Revolution, but then the subsequent revolutions, particularly post-war in the 1950s, it completely changed the way that wines here are made and allowed the grape variety Nebbiolo in particular, in my opinion, to shine. Not that I tasted the wines beforehand, but certainly the evidence seems to be that way. Um, they never used to, they used to blend the regions together. So very rarely did they focus on, on soils. They were blended in different grape varieties. I already mentioned that they've stopped doing that now. Um, and everything has become stricter. The yields for Barolo are 56 hectolitres per hectare maximum. That's quite tight. Uh, that's a good a good size yield um, to keep and preserve quality. And I mentioned earlier, Argentina is way above that, and the the grape sadly uses some loses some of its its beauty and its finesse. There are two particular regions, uh, or sorry, two particular um, distinctions that I've just mentioned uh, when we were discussing Barbaresco. You may remember I said La Mora and Barolo, which are the western ones with the the more calcareous mile, mile, why do I keep saying mile? <laughs> Those are the fruitier, they're the more aromatic expressions, they're the expressions more akin to Barbaresco. So ironically, Barolo is more akin to Barbaresco, just in the nature, La Mora and Barolo being the two little subregions. And then there are three other subregions, they are literally on the other side of the road, you can drive between the two. Um, Castagnoni Faglietto, Monforte de Alba, and um, I'm never going to pronounce this one, Serralunga de Alba. Um, and they are to the east and they are sandstone. So they have kind of a less compact soil. It's poorer. It's less fertile. It's still calcareous mild, but they have a lot of sandstone in there. Um, and what that actually does is it makes the wines more intense, more mature, um, and they mature more slowly. So those wines, you actually want to keep even longer. Um, but the aging for Barolo is also generally across the board older, longer as well. So it's it's 38 months. So I mentioned it was exactly a year more than Barbaresco um, and 18 months minimum oak. And that is because of that power and that intensity. It's deemed that they need longer. Um, there is a trend for making Barolo earlier drinking. And way back when at the beginning, when we had our oak page and I showed you, you could get vanilla and toast and smoke and all sorts. The reason I wanted to say that there's such a wide variety of oak is in order to make Barolo easier to drink younger and more approachable, a lot of more modern winemakers have, have moved away from the old Slovenian huge barrels, the sort of body barrels, and have been using French barriques because the small area of the small French barriques and often new French barriques just speeds up that aging process, the development of the tannins, the oxygenation, um, but it does impart flavor. So most producers, or certainly a lot of producers, now lie somewhere in the middle and they might use a combination. And that's exactly what this producer has done. They have used a combination of old Slovenian, young uh, 
Old French, large French, and then barriques as well. So they're actually, I'll grab the wine now because I'm very excited. Uh, they're actually fermented in barriques, which generally, not exclusively, it's an expensive um, endeavor, but it's um it's a good way to make the oxygen better integrated when you do come to it. So when you come to aging in oak, um, if you have done your fermentation in barrique, particularly with white wine, but also with red wine, the, the oak tends to integrate a little bit faster. For anyone wanting to know, 2010 was quite a challenging vintage. Um, it was quite cool, so there's some high acidity. Um, if you made the wine badly, it didn't live very long. If you made it well, it lives a very long time. And I'm sorry, that's such a useful, uh, useless rather, useless thing to say. Um, but this is a producer that made it well, so it's lasted. Um, and Busia, the commune this comes from, is one of those ones that needs the long time for integration. So... Uh, that's why if you have got any of your others left don't blame me if you don't and you are tasting along you'll actually notice that this wine is the darkest um, and it has got this very very intense extraction it was macerated for 50 days um, and it was 50 days in those barriques um, so it's it's actually taken on more of the color from the skins um, so after its year in barriques it spent one year after its ferment sat in those barriques and then the second and third year it's spent in small oak and 500 litre oaks so I've explained the smaller oak uh, speeding up uh, the, pro the aging process of some of the wine and then the 500 litre less so and then they blend them all together to make the final wine. Uh, they then aged it for 14 more months they actually find it so they clarified it is a it's not quite the right term but a good way to think about it they didn't filter it um so you might also find that this wine is slightly cloudier than the others and they wanted to preserve that um beautiful uh some of the beautiful aromatics um but yes then they aged it for another 14 months in, bot uh, in bottle now i really do hope that you left this wine a bit longer it for me is packed full of dried fruits dried figs dried cranberries um all those beautiful things um, and then it's also got the leather. It's got a little bit of truffle, but I wouldn't go. It's too. It's not too umami for me. It's actually more meaty and gamey. But members, please do let me know. Um, it's got um, something really herbal about it and something really um, violet lifted. I'm less roses here and definitely more violet. I've just seen somebody say, is the, is the Lange Nebbiolo made by Ritzy? Yeah, I think I mentioned that earlier. They do produce our, our Lange Nebbiolo and it's an absolutely cracking one. Um, Mahesh has just kindly put it in the chat if you haven't tried it before. Yeah, I think whoever's just, sorry, I can't see, but somebody's just said savoury notes complement the dried fruits. Yeah, absolutely. There's a lot going on. And this is what happens when Barolo ages. I'd say this is ready to drink and you need to drink it relatively quickly, but you have found it in kind of this perfect window where it's almost um i've read a few reviews on our website earlier and somebody said it's port like that is sort of the intention that dried fruit um that you get from port that's what really good barolo should you know i think port like you might say oh it's jammy or overcooked no 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 it's all the good bits about port for me it's um savory spicy it's dried fruits it's yeah it's kind of christmas in a class um but let's have a taste Hmm. it is still so acidic in a beautiful way because it's still refreshing so it doesn't fall flat and saggy on the palate those tannins do you know if you are tasting along do you maybe notice how they've integrated more so they're much softer um they're less kind of intense maybe than the than the other tannins but the, the level of them is really high so there's still very high tannins but they're integrated better in my opinion um yeah I think it's um oh yeah it's it's an interesting wine I think you want to be drinking it probably sooner rather than later for me personally anyway um but certainly it's at its absolute prime for me. Um, good old Barolo. It's really herby. I kind of want to pour it on a lamb dish. Um, I don't know whether you'd join me in that, but for me, that's the perfect lamb sauce. Dried currants, herbs, a bit of meat, um, a slight bit of pepper as well. So it's a lot going on. Um, right, I've gone through all the wines. I've just seen one question pop up about the producer uh, who makes this. 
And they asked, is, are they biodynamic? And the answer is they are definitely certified organic. And I think they practice biodynamics. So, um, yes, they're growing cover crops in the center. And um, there's a few important things that those cover crops would do. So um, they would have. So you'll see there's no grapes on the vines here. That's because the cover crops are helping uh, keep moisture in the soil. Surprisingly, they're not actually taking too much out. And what they'll do is they'll then flatten them when the grapes need all of the water content from the soil. So they'll flatten those weeds, they're not yeah, cover crops, green manure, um, and then that actually keeps the moisture locked into the soil. So for those lovely, long, sunny, um, long Indian summers that they need. So, yes, that is exactly what you saw. Well done, BDI member. Um, right now, I'm conscious of time. Um, Mahesh has got to shoot off this evening. So Mahesh, if you have to go behind the scenes, that's absolutely fine. I've got both my laptops on the go so I can hang around and answer the rest of the questions this evening. So if you do need to go, Mahesh, then then thank you. Um, and members, I'm going to try and get through as many as I can. But I have to say we've got more questions this evening than um, we've had in a long time. So I'll try and get through a few um, and we'll see where we're at. Um, and I'll get through them just tasting along with my with my lovely 2010 Barolo. Um, are any of the new are there? So John Cavanaugh's asked about any areas in the new world where Nebbiolo is grown and are they approaching quality? I hope I answered that already. <laughs> Someone said it's Mahesh going clubbing. No, poor Mahesh is still in the office. So I think he might be being thrown out of the, <laughs> out of the office. He's been doing something else top secret for me this evening. So, um, yes, he's got to go. John, I hope I answered your question. The answer is no. Um, Northwest Italy is the only place growing Nebbiolo to this quality. Uh, not just Piemonte, there are a few other places growing really high quality Nebbiolo, but um, not outside Italy at the moment, unfortunately. A really interesting other question, is Nebbiolo a variety already benefiting from climate change and what does the future hold for it in this respect? Um, an incredible question. Nebbiolo is going to be challenged mainly in climate change by the fact that it buds early. That early budding and the fact that the frosts are getting later and later and later. Um, you know, if you're getting frosts at the end of April, or the beginning of May, you're basically destroying quite a lot of the potential yield of your um, Nebbiolo. So uh, there are, it does have some uh, benefits, should we say. So um, the longer growing season, uh, it tends to like slower and longer rather than hot and short. Um, so, for example, there are some varieties that cope very well with shorter seasons that get very, very hot. Grenache, for example, being one of them. Um, so you can grow Grenache quite well in the southern Rome because it doesn't and move out because they can get very, very hot for a less extended period of time and produce really decent ripe grapes. Nebbiolo tends to like a longer season. So... Um, climate change isn't really giving us that necessarily at the moment and those spring frosts are quite problematic but it does like warmth so yes to some extent there will certainly be other places um, that you will be able to um, that you will be able to grow nebbiolo in the future that perhaps you couldn't I've just seen in the chat are frosts getting later yeah strangely Chris they are um, the there are um or, or rather, I should say they're more frequently later. <laughs> Sorry, that's really terrible English. But the, the late frosts that you find at the beginning of May are now more frequent than ever. Uh, they used to be a sort of once in a decade thing, um, and they're now coming three or four times in a decade. Um, and that is, is apportioned to climate change. Um, nobody really knows why either, which is a bit worrying. Um, Oh, I'm just going to quickly, because Mahesh has sent me some of these, so I apologise. Um, is Piemonte well set up for wine tourism? And if so, which wineries would you recommend? Now, Peter, that's a fantastic question, because I'd like to know the answer myself. <laughs> um, the I know that the Piemonte region is very well set up for, um, for tourists. It's not your sort of flashy um, California, South Africa, South Southwest... Yeah, Southern Australian, um, you know, restaurants and terrace. It would be, it's far more um, family focused. So if you do go, you'll probably be ending up speaking to a family member of the winery. I know that Ritzi, for example, were very keen to get 
um, guests to come, but it will probably be, you know, grandma or whoever showing you around or, or giving you a little tasting. Um, the reason I say um, I'd like to know is I'd really like to visit and I haven't, but everything I hear about the Piemonte region is that it's fantastically well set up for tourism. I do, however, hear that you must like truffles, <laughs> which is fine, I do. Um, but certain times of year, obviously you'll get the black truffles, the white truffles, but almost exclusively you will end up eating very, very similar meals, all delicious, but at the little tavernas, well, you'll end up with um, truffle everything, lots of pasta. I mean, it sounds heaven to me, so I'm fine with that. Um, so yes, Peter, the answer is yes. I can't personally recommend any wineries. I'll have a dig around. The Wine Society website used to have um, some recommendations, so I will try and find some. Um, I've heard, so this is a, a slightly challenging question because it says to a non-expert, how would I find the difference? How would I know the difference between a Barolo and a Barbaresco and what should I look for? Now, I hope I answered this, but the reality is nothing is, there is no hard and fast rule. So it's not as easy as um, Barbaresco is lighter and fruitier. Yes, that used to be the case. Um, but as I also mentioned, the two styles are converging more and you have the same um, soil in La Mora and Barolo that you do in Barbaresco. So that fruitier aromatic style that you used to traditionally find um, is less uh is less obvious now and perhaps you know easier to spot i think i like the ritzy barbaresco because it actually does stick true to that tradition it is that fruit forward aromatic floral style that barbaresco was famous for um but you certainly can't guarantee that now um, you might buy a barbaresco and it will taste like a, a, an old barolo used to so um i wish i could be uh yeah I wish I could wish I could ask that better. Um, Ian has asked, how do I rate Lange Nebbiolo? I think Lange Nebbiolo for me is probably the best quality for money if you go to a good producer. Um, so Ritzy's Lange Nebbiolos are fantastic. Um, you can often find that a Lange Nebbiolo might be declassified uh, Barolo or Barbaresco, not exclusively, and it doesn't always work like that. But some of the sites can go into Lange. And if you have grapes that you don't think are going to stand the test of that really intensive aging that legally you have to do for those regions, then you might decide that you're going to make a Lange Nebbiolo from it because the, the aging regulations aren't, aren't as um, intense. So it can be, um, yeah, it can be a really beautiful sort of more everyday drinking style, but you can get declassified Barolo grapes that are very, very powerful. Um, for me, however, it's your real midweek drinking Nebbiolo and generally the quality is really good. So shop around, but there, if a producer makes a Barolo and a Barbaresco and a Lange Nebbiolo, you might want to consider the fact that those Lange Nebbiolo uh, grapes may have come from somewhere rather nice. Um, right, I've probably got time for one more question. Um, can you explain the difference? I think this is a fantastic question. Um, I think, uh, oh, just really quickly, I've had, just had a member say that there's some fascinating um, conversation in the chat and that they're not on the video recordings. So that's true. They don't translate to uh, the YouTube channel, but we do keep a copy. Um, now, of course, we um, there's nothing confidential. Nobody's names are on there. If there's a piece of information you saw on the chat, for example, I saw somebody pop up a second ago to talk about the Truffle Festival in Alba. Um, if there is something that you missed, please just jot it down. We can grab it for you because we do keep a recording. It's just not something that is very easy to share with us, uh, with everyone afterwards. Please let us know there if you say, ah, oh, a member recommended some places to visit. I can copy, copy and paste it for you and I'll um, take out the names anyway. Um, so sorry, let's go back to the differences of members' opinions on the website for the Barolo. I think there's a few things at play here. I think the main one is that um, traditionally, should we say, um, Barolo is, uh, well, how, how would I explain this? There's a lot of people saying it's port-like on the website. And for me, um, it's really tricky. My father does not like old wines. 
I asked him to try this wine earlier because um, I'm staying with them at the moment. And he said he much preferred the Barbaresco. My husband, on the other hand, loves old wines and he preferred the Barolo. Now, the interesting um, differentiation or the distinction between the two is actually something that another member has flagged on the chat. Um, there is something old and there's something old and woody. And what that tends to do is it can be quite an, an overpowering um, aroma, as can the dried fruits. And it can tend to, if you're not used to drinking old wines, you can find that it feels less fresh. And that's certainly a, a sort of language that my dad uses. He says it loses all the fruit. Now, that is the point. <laughs> We've kept this wine back because it's able to age. I think one of the issues with this wine in particular is that it's priced at £28. Now, for a wine that is 12 years old and that has this sort of huge structure and old character, tertiary character, £28 is very affordable. If you were buying this because other Barolos, which I'm just going to check whilst I'm chatting to you, but I think other Barolos we're selling at the moment, the one we, we tasted yesterday, the exhibition from the same producer is 26 Now, um, 26 and 28 you might go, oh, I'll go for the older one. But if you're used to drinking £26 Barolo, which is normally at its, its most recent release, um, you know, normally comes out onto the market, let's say 2016, 2018, uh, those wines are, are priced at 26 pounds and you're used to what you get. So intensity, high tannins, high acid, but still packs and packs of fruit. A 2010 Barolo, in my opinion, is worth more than 28 